So in the interest of time, I'm going to um, get started with introductions for today. Thank you all so much for coming and attending. I'm sure that more people will be arriving um, as we get started. Um, before we do get started, though, I do want to especially recognize that today is Orange Shirt Day um, and to do a land acknowledgement. So as a settler on this land, I recognize and acknowledge that McMaster and my home are located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and the Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement. And I think this message is especially important today. And I want to take a moment for all of us to honor the indigenous children who were taken from their families through the residential school system. Um, we must recognize that this is a cultural genocide with deep rooted consequences. Um, and our indigenous neighbors face intergenerational impacts and violence um, to this day. So today should mark a continued commitment to truth and reconciliation. And I implore you, implore you, if you haven't already, to read the Truth and Reconciliation Report and the 94 resulting calls to action to learn about the history of the residential school system and the continued consequences. Now, this is something we should be doing 365 days a year. And today is an opportunity to make that commitment to do that. Um, to advance your learning, McMaster and other organizations have created resources to help, and the University of Alberta has an excellent online course on Indigenous Canada, which is a good place to start. So remember that it's important that we listen to Indigenous voices, as theirs are the only ones that matter in understanding what we need, with what is needed to heal from this intergenerational trauma of the residential school system. And I'm gonna actually post in the chat a, a link that will take you to a site that curates data so that when you put in your postal code, it will identify the peoples who traditional lands that you are currently on. So I wanna just thank you for taking those steps. Now to get to why we're all here today is I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker and what we're hoping will be a continuing series on artificial intelligence and machine learning in healthcare. And Dr. Lingyang Chu is our, our first speaker. He's an assistant professor new to McMaster just since January of this year. He has a bachelor of science in telecommunication engineering and a PhD in computer science. Prior to coming to McMaster, he led the AI research team at Huawei Technologies in BC. His research focuses on algorithmic data mining, machine learning, and deep learning, with a focus on transferring research to real-world applications such as healthcare. Of particular interest to today's talk, he develops novel methods to understand that black box of deep neural networks. I know that's a challenge that confounds many of us as we move to integrate AI into healthcare. We're grateful he will share his knowledge on interpretable AI today. So for logistics, um, feel free to use the chat function if you have any questions as we go along. And then uh, there will also be an opportunity for us to have questions at the end. So I'm going to uh, send it over to you, Lin Yang. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thank you for the introduction, Cynthia. And uh, thank you all for coming today to attend this talk. So uh, today I will talk about uh, some like uh, uh, basic and uh, advanced topics uh, involving interpreting deep neural networks and uh, with a special emphasis on the potentials in medical health, right? So let's get started. So uh, today uh, uh, we'll cover like three major uh, parts. The first part is that why do we need to interpret deep neural networks? And the second is what have been done? And uh, I've also introduced several of my works that has been done recently. And uh, uh, then we will talk about open problems and uh, talk about the takeaways of this uh, uh, talk. All right, let's get started. So uh, firstly, uh, I would like to briefly introduce what is the general idea of machine learning. So machine learning is in general considered to be a set of methods or algorithms that allows computer to learn from data and make and also improve predictions. 
So the predictions can be anything, can be like predicting the risk of future accidents, predicting the risk of future disease or diagonalize, uh, diagonalize uh, um, uh, the probability of getting some kind of disease, such things. And uh, previously, I mean, several decades ago, when we don't have anything like machine learning, we do, you know, knowledge uh, uh, expert system. Uh, something like, uh, okay, so we ask experts to read out rules, to write, uh, to program those rules into computer programs and, you know, to verify each instruction to make predictions. But later we have statistical learning and machine learning, and then people say that, okay, the power of data-driven algorithms, that is, you don't really try to code the instructions and policies into a computer program. What we do is that we let the computer algorithm and program to compile and learn the policies and patterns from data, right? So in this way, we have more or less the modern machine learning framework that allows us to do this, right? And uh, it is powerful. And uh, that is where deep learning comes out. Yes, yeah. And uh, then, Soon after we, you know, enter the era of deep learning, the powerful deep learning, we encounter one thing, especially in those high, highly risky applications of deep learning. That is, whenever a computer makes a prediction, many users would like to ask, so why and how did you arrive at that conclusion or that prediction? Then the computer would be, you know, be awkwardly very silent because the computer will have no ability to explain and interpret and also reason about the predictions that is automatically made by its algorithm, right? That is one bottleneck that limits the massive applications of deep learning algorithms in, you know, you know those risk sensitive, high stake applications such as medical health, right? So yeah, so before we actually talk about uh, interpreting deep neural networks, the first thing we need to figure out is what is interpretability, right? So up until now, there is, unfortunately, there is no mathematical definition of interpretability. But fortunately, we do have several qualitative definitions, right? So uh, here are two typical qualitative definitions from two of these papers. First one is saying, okay, so interpretability is the degree to which a human can understand the cause of a decision. That is, okay, so you need to, if you want to do a interpretation algorithm, then the output of this interpretation algorithm, which is called an interpretability or explanation, will be able to help people understand what causes the computer algorithm to arrive at this decision, okay? And according to Kim, in, I mean, that paper published in 2016, uh, interpretability is the degree to which a human can consistently predict the model's results. So this is like um, a better uh, or like a, a even a more advanced requirement on the uh, interpretability. That is, okay, so uh, uh, whenever you produce some kind of interpretation or explanation, then a human can follow that interpretation, follow the pro policy, Con, uh, concluded from that interpretation and make similar or consistent predictions as that is made by the model, right? So that is something that is applicable by a human instead of, you know, executed by a computer. That is what we mean by interpretability. And if you conclude from these two qualitative definitions, you will reach a very interesting key idea. That is the higher the interpretability of a machine learning model is, the easier it will be for someone to comprehend why certain decisions or predictions have been made by a machine, right? So, so that is what we uh, mean by, okay, what is uh, interpretability? And here are some examples, very cool examples of interpretations that have already been done by previously published papers. So one thing here is what we see as like uh, the saliency map. So that is one format of interpretation. So that is when, say for example, some people tries to build a deep learning model that helps well, help us to predict whether there are some disease with the eyeballs of a human, right? And here is, could be some medical images that are captured by some kind of equipment from the eyes of a human. 
And uh, by applying the machine learning algorithm, deep learning algorithm on this image, the predicted output would be some kind of risky score. Say, okay, there's like a 99% of chance that this human have some kind of disease. But then one question raised. So we only have a score, right? So no one tells us, so why is this eyeball image has such a kind of a disease? Why is that? I'm, I mean, if it's a doctor, then people at uh, the doctor would like analyze the image and tell people, okay, so it's due to this area. And uh, this area is the, the part that has this disease or that's caused the, causing this disease. And, uh, and that is why the doctor arrive at his conclusion. But for computer, before interpretation algorithms come to existence, a computer only gives you a number, which is you know, far from convincing, right? But nowadays, by using this type of interpretation algorithm, we could produce saliency maps that are highlighted areas in these medical images, which helps you to understand which part of this eyeball is going wrong, which part is potentially having that disease, and the, which part is focused by the neural network to arrive at its own decision about 99% of you know, probability of getting that disease. So this is one example. Another one is that we could actually derive some kind of uh, policy or rules from a deep neural network and uh, compile that into a decision tree. For example, uh, I mean, there are a lot of self-check policies to you know, do the self-check at home in the morning just to verify whether I am infected by COVID-19 or not, right? So say if I have a fever or I have a cough or something. So I have, we have to answer a lot of yes or no questions. So, that is exactly what this paper did. I mean, it's a very long time ago, but uh, the same key idea is that whenever you have a machine learning model that is making automatic predictions, you can always try to design an algorithm to extract some kind of decision tree out of that model. And in this decision tree, you will see something like this. So after answering several, uh, like a sequence of yes or no answers, you will reach some kind of decision, right? So this is, pretty much following the second uh, definition of interpretability. That is, if, you, if a human can consistently use the interpretation to predict the model's results, then that is some kind, some level of interpretation, interpretability, right? So that is one way to, another way to do interpretation. And uh, there are also other ways. For example, if we have uh, many structured data, that is, uh, uh, these data are like, uh, if it's like the user profile in a bank. Right? So whether the age and the work class, the education, medical status, or many other things of the, that describes a human. So uh, the bank, uh, a bank would say possibly use a deep learning algorithm to try to predict whether, okay, this person has an annual income that's less than uh, 50K or more than 50K, right? But it, the outcome of that neural network will only be a number, a probability of less than uh, 50K or more than 50K. But then people will say, okay, so how does this com computer arrive at such probability? Then what we can do is that we could highlight the attributes such that we, we tell people, okay, the marriage status and is having a very positive influence on the probability. And also the capital gain, hours per week and occupation and education will have another uh, influence on predicting these people as having less than 50K. So that is one another way that we could do to produce interpretations. That is by highlighting the important and the most influencing attributes uh, of your input data. And also nowadays, another very hot area is to build a neural network that is called a graph neural network that can take a graph as input and produce some kind of uh, information related to the graph. For example, we can, we can predict whether that graph is a good molecular or a bad molecular. I mean, a good molecular could be something that is good for health, a bad thing that could be thing, something that may cause cancer, right? And then uh, the output of the deep neural network will be just be a risky score saying, okay, this, this molecular is, has a very high probability to cause cancer, but then you, want, you, uh, you will want to ask why. So why does this molecular have this kind of effect? then uh, by doing a proper interpretation, you will be able to highlight the counterparts of this molecular. That is, I mean, some parts of, you know, of this molecular, for example, this carbon atom and this N item and some oxygen item together, that is some particular structure of this graph structure of the molecular. 
that is actually deciding this medicare have this effect of causing cancer. This graph could be a protein, could be a chemical compound, could be anything that could be represented by a graph, right? So this kind of technology is also very useful in medical health, I believe. And uh, then, so much for the examples of interpretation. So why do we need those interpretations? Let's revisit this question. We need inter these interpretations is because in many risk sensitive tasks, for example, healthcare, medicine, design, bioscience, I mean, if you are doing with genes and also chemical compounds, if you are trying to synthesize uh, different chemical compounds, I mean, in computer before you actually, you know, do the experiments or you actually take the action to actually synthesize that compound. People usually simulate it in the computer first, right? So then in these high sensitive tasks, if you something made wrong, then that could you know, cost, cost someone's life or cost a lot of money. So that is why people desperately need interpretations. For example, this is a very simple example. Say if some people go to the hospital, but there's no doctors there, just the machine telling people, okay, so you're sick with probability of 0 0.7, you need to take some procedures. For example, cut your arm or cut some, some part of your body to cure you, right? But you know, the cost is very high stake. You, I mean, no one would want to cut one part of my body just you know, to cure something that may seem to be so abstract. That is why we need to ask why. Why do I need to cut that part? Why do I need this, you know, this procedure to cure myself, right? So that is why we need interpretation. So, the interpretation in conclusion is very important from many perspectives. First of all, it helps to reduce potential risks, right? It, it convinces people say, okay, you're sick. Why is that? Because we found some problematic area in your body and uh, that is causing the disease, right? So it re reduces potential risks and also into improves fairness. Uh, well, so to improve fairness because uh, you know, we encounter a lot of problems when building machine learning models in large, uh, on large data set. So for example, if you want to build a model to predict whether someone is having, is catching a cold and someone is not, then depending on the population of your data, there might be some minority group in your data that might not receive a very good prediction accuracy. So that is what we call by machine learning is unfair with respect to those minority group. So if you want to be fair to those minority group, the first thing you need to do is to identify which group is that group. And the secondly, you want to know why is that group uh, being treated so unfairly by the machine learning model. And this requires interpretation as well. And also uh, a good interpretation will help a lot in building trust with users, with patients, also with doctors. I mean, it's the trust between a machine and a doctor. It's also a trust between a machine and the user. So by building this trust, we'll massively improve the application scenario and depths of machine learning algorithms in the area of medical health. And sometimes it also helps to discover new knowledge. I will talk about this later, uh, all right? Okay, so now let's talk about what have been done. I mean, there are a lot of works that have been done in this area because it's a very hot area in my area, the machine learning area, right? So uh, let's talk about what has been done. How do we interpret a neural network? I'm categorizing existing works into like uh, four categories and I'm summarizing the key ideas such that we could you know, skip a lot of irrelevant details. The first one is uh, people try to analyze the hidden neurons of a neural network. So if you recognize this neural network, we have an input layer, we have an output layer, and we have hidden layers. So in these hidden layers, we have hidden neurons, which are like basic computational units that helps to make decisions using this neural network, right? So each internal hidden neuron is one part of the neural, neural network, one part of the decision process of the neural network. So then people will say, okay, so since we are going to interpret this neural network, why don't we just focus on the basic unit, right? So people, there are many methods that focus on interpreting, okay. So instead of interpreting what does the entire neural network do, we focus on interpreting what does this neuron do, right? And if we can interpret the every neuron, then possibly we could interpret the neural network, right? But the problem is that analyzing a hidden neuron cannot always provide deep insight into the overall behavior of the entire neural network. That is, Quite normal because you're focusing on some very local unit, 
right? I mean, understanding how a screw works will, will never let you fully understand how a big machine works, right? So that is the problem with this type of work. And another type of work is trying to mimic the model, okay? So for example, we have a very, um, we have a deep neural network, okay? So well, the big neural network is something that's you know, very complicated. It's a black box. We cannot possibly understand what's going on inside. And then people say, okay, so why don't we just try to mimic the input and output mapping of this neural network? Because the neural network, you take some input and produce some output, right? So if you could build some kind of model that is by itself, by design, is easy to understand. And at the same time, that model can produce the same output based on the same input uh, or very similar output based on the same input uh, comparing to the neural network. That means the behavior of your smaller, easy to understand model is somehow comparable to the behavior of the original neural network that we tried to interpret. And in this way, uh, you don't really need to go and interpret the deep neural network anymore because you have this transparent model which you can easily understand and uh, then you could just interpret that uh, transparent model you have. So for example, people could build a decision tree that mimics the behavior of a neural network. And once you successfully build this decision tree, then you don't really need that neural network anymore. You just use this decision tree and you can understand every decision made by this decision tree by traversing the path from the root node to a branch node, right? So that is how people do this. That's the key idea. We build something that is easy to understand to mimic the behavior of something that is hard to understand. Okay, so that's the key idea. But this type of method, we still have a problem. It is because there's always a gap between the interpretations of a mimic model and the target neural network model because the mimic model is not equivalent. It's not exactly the same as the neural network model. So the decision logic carried by this mimic model can be, can be substantially different from the interpreted neural network. Therefore, the interpretations are not exact. That's not trustworthy, okay? Because uh, the mimic model is a fake model, okay? It's a duplicate fake model. So that's the problem with this type of method. And another type of method is called local interpretation. This is a little bit different from the local of the uh, interpreted neurons. This is like uh, in the feature space, we look at a very limited area of a feature space and try to generate some decision logic in there, right? So it's uh, on medical health, you could think about, so this is like, uh, you look at one patient and look at like uh, five or four, like more, most similar patients of that and try to derive the decision, try to derive why uh, does this small group of patients are having this disease? So that is the key idea of this local interpretation. But in doing so, you will instantly know that, okay, so there might be some problems. The zero gradient problem is a mathematical problem that is related to the internal mass of the deep neural network. So we don't, we can skip that. But the second limitation is quite general is that, that the interpretations might be inconsistent for prospectively indistinguishable instances. It is because say, you, it, is, it is quite common for you to say, okay, if you have two patients that look similar, have similar symptoms, but when you apply your inter interpreting uh, algorithm on each of these two patients, the interpretation can be substantially different. Okay, this is because they're doing local interpretations. So they are quite, um, uh, not, they're not quite robust to the influence of noise. Okay, so this is another problem with this type of method. And we also have some other methods that's called the transparent method. The key idea is to build a transparent model uh, directly such that the model itself is interpretable. For example, you could directly train a decision tree, right? Uh, and, uh, or you can directly train a logistic regression or use statistical uh, learning methods, classical ones. For example, use Bayesian classifiers to train a model to make predictions. But in that way, uh, as we all know, uh, the deep learning is dominating the prediction performance, right? So if you try to make a model transparent, there's always a trade-off. That means you have to sacrifice the final prediction accuracy or specific uh, specificity or like sensitivity. So that is something people don't want to lose. And that is the problem with transparent model, right? So if you want to have natural transparency, natural interpretations directly from the model, 
Unfortunately, you will always have to sacrifice some of your prediction performance. And there's another you know, recent uh, trend of building interpretable models that is a black box methods. So people will say, okay, why don't we just try to build a deep neural network B to interpret another deep neural network A, right? Well, so this type of work, the deep neural network B usually can generate translating interpretations for deep neural network A, but one problem arises very soon is who is going to interpret deep neural network B? Right, so you are using a black box to generate the interpretations for another black box. Then who is going to look over the second black box? That's a problem. Okay, so in conclusion, we need reliable interpretations. And you may wonder, so what is a reliable interpretation? A reliable interpretation have several properties. Right, so the properties are listed in here. Firstly, we need the interpretation to be exact. That is, we need our interpretation to be truthful to the interpreted deep neural network. If it, if it is not truthful, it is not, you know, uh, not worthy to believe in it, right? And consistency is that we need less confusion and less contradiction between different interpretations that applies to similar but different instances, right? And uh, the third one is robustness. That means, uh, okay, an interpretation should not be affected significantly by noise. For example, if you want to highlight the problematic area of an uh, eyeball image, then if you like, say, rotate the image a little bit, slightly rotate the image a, a little bit, or you know, slightly blur the image a little bit, you do not want your interpretation to be significantly changed. So that is what we mean by robust. And we also need to be representative. So representative means that we need to identify the real and the general cause of a prediction. That is, okay, so for the maybe for 1,000 patients having the same disease, the interpretation are always consistently the same. That is, that means you find the real reason for that cause of that certain type of disease, right? Say, so, but another, the opposite, uh, the opposite is that, okay, so if you have like uh, 1,000 patients, but for each patient, you have a different interpretation. Although those patients are all having the same disease, then people will say, okay, so your interpretation is not quite trustworthy because you're, in, you're trying to uh, explaining one typical case by one uh, unique interpretation, right? So that's not general enough to cover the common cause of a lot of, uh, uh, patients with the same disease. Okay, so these four points are what consist of a reliable interpretation. And next, I will introduce two of my works that focuses on generating really reliable interpretations. The first one is called uh, finding exact and consistent interpretations. As we, as we recall, uh, exactness and consistency are two basic requirements of reliable in, uh, interpretations. Exactly means that your interpretation need to be faithful. Or in here, we, we prove that our interpretation is mathematically equivalent to the logic, to the decision logic of a deep neural network. So mathematically, it is exact, it is proved, right? And also, we need our interpretation to be consistent. That means we need our interpretation to stay the same for a lot of instances that are having the same disease, right? So if you have like a thousand patients having the same disease and you're trying to apply your interpretation algorithm on these patients, your interpretation will always be the same, okay? If you predict that the person will have a heart attack, the reason is that the heart is problematic. There's some problem within the heart. You are not going to generate some kind of notation or another patient saying because the lung is a problem, right? So that's something what we mean by consistent. And how do we do that? Uh, well, so there are a lot of mathematics here, but the, uh, the key idea is what the uh, deep neural network did, actually mathematically we proved it, is that it partitions the feature space of your data. And uh, when you partitions this feature space, the feature space will be partitioned into many different blocks, right? So within each block, uh, there will be similar instances, similar data instances, data samples contained in each block. 
And then uh, there will also be a decision boundary associated with each block such that uh, the uh, instances contained in the same block, but carrying different label. For example, one instance carrying a red label, meaning it, it has some disease, uh, carrying a blue label, meaning it does not have some kind of disease, right? So uh, within each block, the decision boundary associated with that block is going to classify, to separate these two types of, um, two types of data samples. And in that way, we could generate our interpretation by using the decision boundaries, which is red line here, and also the polytop boundaries that are like surrounding and defining this green area. Okay, so that is how we generate our interpretations. And uh, how we achieve consistency is simply because uh, all of these instances contained in the same green area, they are sharing exactly the same decision boundary. And since they are sharing essentially exactly the same decision boundary, the decision logic will be exactly the same. And if, we're, we're, if they are sharing exactly the same decision logic, then uh, they will have exactly the same interpretation generated by our algorithm. And that is how we make sure mathematically that our interpretation will be exact and consistent, right? So then let's see some toy examples in here. So here, is a very interesting toy example. So uh, we have a lot of blue dots as a two dimensional feature. So there are, we have two dimensions of features. The first dimension is X1, which is a real value. And the second feature is also uh, is X2, which is also a real value. So we have many different real values. And uh, then we are going to assign labels to these points. So the red points are considered as one class and the blue points are considered as another class, right? So then we plot how the neural network partition this feature space into different blocks. So this is run by simulation. We can see that it matches well with our theory in before. So we're saying that a deep neural network is going to partition the feature space. And this is what we got by simulation and that proves that demonstrates our theory is right. Right, and then we are. Uh, what we did next is okay. Uh, uh, like we said, so uh, deep neural networks is going to associate the decision boundary for each piece of the uh, partition grid. Right, so then uh, we can actually piece together, like like playing with Lego. Right, so we can piece together these different pieces of decision boundaries, and then you can see okay, this gives us recovers the decision boundary between the red dots and the blue dots that helps us to classify the red dots from the blue dots. And that is how we mathematically and analytically extract the actual, the exact decision boundary of a deep neural network, right? And that is why our interpretation is proved to be exact, to be loyal to the machine. Therefore it is trustworthy. And this is some experiment. So uh, in here, we're doing a little bit more complicated data set. That is, we have two classes of images. The first one is boots, so that, you know, all kinds of boots. And the second one is bags, you know, uh, handbags. So the, the shape, the, the, the first row of these images is showing the average picture. Average picture is that when you sum up all the images together and divide by total number, and this is the uh, uh, basic average control of the shape of, you know, objects in this class. You can see this is like a boot and this is like a bag, so that's it. And then uh, you can see that uh, the interpretations that we extract from this data set is saying, okay, so uh, the uh, heated area in like a warmer color, closer to red is showing, okay, these pixels are the pixels decided by the neural network that has a very positive influence to help predicting an instance of ankle boot as ankle boot. And the blue areas, the cold area, cold areas, are the, you know, the areas that is going to uh, help the uh, a new network to predict something not as an ankle boot, that is opposite as the back. So for bags, you can see the upper left color and this one in here is going to help the new network to predict something as a bag. So if something have a very strong response, a very large value of pixels in this area and this area, then it will, be highly possible to be predicted as a bag. So this is like this highlighted heated areas are identifying the dominating areas. Look, I mean, focused by the neural network 
to make its predictions on whether this image is an ankle boot or a back. So in your analogy, consider whether, okay, so this is an eyeball image, right? So then you could identify the, the, uh, the important areas of this eyeball image that determines the prediction of the neural network to predicting whether this eyeball has some kind of disease or not, right? So that's, I mean, pretty much the same problem. And then later we, have, we derived another uh, work that was published in ICCV 2021. Uh, that's a principal conference in computer vision. And uh, so for this work, what we did is we find representative interpretations. So I'm going to skip the details of this algorithm. I'm going to show you some results. Okay, so what is a representative interpretation? A representative interpretation is that we do not only highlight the area that supports the decision of a neural network. What we did is that we're going to go back and look at the training data of the neural network. And also we're going to find a lot of supporting evidences such that these images uh, that we found, the top one, top two, top three, top four, they, these, uh, we can do top 20, but uh, we are due to limited of space, we only show top four. So these images are from the training data. And uh, why do we pick these images by our algorithm? Is that these images are sharing the common feature as the input image, the both cats, and they are having the same posture and they are having the same, uh, pretty much uh, very similar features. And these cats will be used as evidence to support why this image is classified as a cat. And now we can interpret the interpretation by not only looking at the heat map, the highlighted area of the input image, but also we have a lot of supporting instances say, okay, so there are a lot of other images that are predicted as a cat due to the same reason that is due to the mouse of the cat. And those images all look like this, the same input image. And now we can say, okay, this neural network makes the prediction uh, on this cat is because it uses its mouse because we have many other similar cases that are using the cat's mouse to predict those as cats, right? So for these cats, you can see that. So for dogs, the same. And different dogs, but they look similar and they're all predicted as dog by looking at their eyes and nose, right? So, I mean, this is the data set for cats and dogs. And we also ran the data set on human faces. The task is to predict whether face belongs to a woman or from a man, right? So then with this, our algorithm discovered that the neural network determines a face is a woman by looking at the eyebrows and eyes of a woman. And we found a lot of evidences. So there are a lot of women that look like the input image, the input face of these women, and they are having similar eyebrows and you know uh, some parts of the eyes that, I mean, you uh, women maybe sometimes they do mock-ups on the eyebrows and this area. I don't know what the English word for that, but you know, that, that way, right? So those are similar parts. And this is the same. So you can see that. So for women, to, for neural network to determine that this is the face of a woman, the neural network will focus on the eye parts, the eyes, eyebrows and eyes. But for men, the story is totally different. The neural network is looking at the mouth part, the, the mustache, you know, the beard stuff. And uh, this is what we call by representative. That is the reason that we found the, the highlighted area that determines the prediction on this input image is not only valid for this input image, but instead it is a common reason why this neural network make predictions on many, many other images, right? So that is what we say by representative. And how is this useful in you know, medical health? Uh, we also did some data set on the ventilo images. So this is the uh, MRI images of their human ventilo. So it's like uh, the vertical cut of a human ventilo. And there are four different types of disease on this data set related to ventilo, healthy, right? So then what we get is, okay, so the neural network is going to highlight some interesting area which I don't know what that is, but uh, you know, the highlighted area. And uh, uh, not only highlight the input image, and uh, not only, only highlight the area for this input image, but the neural, our algorithm will also be able to find many other images, many other X MRI images from different patients, such that these images are having exactly the same disease as your input image. And the reason why these images are predicted as the same disease as the input image are all the same as the reason for the input image. 
That is what we say by the representative information. That means we're finding the common cause of its disease that generally applies to a large number of similar disease images with the same disease, right? So we're not only trying to interpret one input image, we're trying to identify the representative reason for that prediction. And uh, okay, so this is not just a toy problem, toy task that we did. So we actually built a demo based on this M uh, MRI image analysis and we built a demo system and we let about like five experienced uh, doctors in the, uh, uh, in very in a very famous hospital in China, let them try that out, and uh, ask them to uh, you know score the performance of the system to see whether they believe in the predictive results or not. And uh, the uh, all the doctors are giving high appraisal to our system, saying that okay, uh, that actually in significantly improves their trust in our machine learning algorithm and the algorithm itself. The, the, the machine learning model itself actually achieves a very high uh, prediction accuracy, right? And uh, uh, this is the second work, which was just accepted by Neuro Apes 2021, which is also a flagship uh, conference in my area. So I will skip the algorithm part, which is you know a little bit more complicated, but um, I will just try to illustrate this, what we do, right? So. What we do is that uh, for a neural network that processes graphs, a graph could be a chemical compound, could be a protein, could be some anchor points in uh, like uh, MRI image of our brain, could be anything that could be modeled as a graph, right? So there are neural networks that are designed to predict properties of a graph, to, you know, to take in a graph as an input and try to predict whether this graph is uh, having some property. For example, whether you have cancer in your brain or whether this chemical compound can be some kind of effective drug or not, right? So, but I mean, other than the prediction, other than the probability of whether this compound is effective or not, people always would wonder, okay, so why is this compound effective? Why is this protein having this effect, right? So then that requires the interpretation to identify the most significant structure, the substructure of that graph that is determining this prediction made by the neural network. And what we did is, okay, so we're trying to highlight some part of our input graph. This is actually a case study of our result. So this is the baseline, this is baseline one, baseline two, and this is the ground truth. The ground truth is something that, okay, so we know that these structures are important for graph to be predicted as its label, right? We know that they are the ground truth. And then to test whether our algorithm is good or not, we just run our interpretation algorithm and check whether our algorithm can produce the ground truth or not. And you can see that for this data set, every column is a data set, all right? So the first data set, the ground truth is this. It's like a, like a house shape with five nodes. And you can see that uh, this is the output of our algorithm where I then define the ground truth accurately. And for this one, the same uh, ground truth structure and we are identifying this ground truth structure. And this one as well, this one as well. And uh, the previous four data sets are synthetic data sets that are generated by graph generation algorithms. But the last one is a real world data set about uh, mutagenicity that is to uh, to predict whether a chemical compound is mutagenic or not. And uh, our algorithm correctly identifies this part of the chemical compound that determines that, okay, this compound is mutagenic, right? Which aligns well with human knowledge, but you know, this is totally unsupervised. So that is another uh, work that uh, is recently done by our team. And uh, here are some open problems that I would like, really like to you know, investigate in the near future. The first one is assisting interpretations by existing uh, knowledge. So uh, what do I mean by that? That is, you know, we have a lot of rich human knowledge in the area of medical health. And such as, you know, uh, I mean, things that show me a lot in, the, in her system, uh, uh, like uh, 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 some time ago. Yeah, so uh, we have standards, we have rules, we have strategies, we have policies in clinics and hospitals, we have a lot of things like that. And we also have a lot of known and confirmed, experimentally confirmed factors that, that with high probability will cause a certain type of disease, right? 
So these are all accumulated human knowledge, which will be very useful in diagnosing uh, uh, medical disease. So how to make sure our interpretations align well with this knowledge, right? So we build a network, uh, build a neural network. The neural network learns from data to make you know, high performance uh, uh, predictions. But you know, who knows what the neural network discovered from the data, right? And, uh, you know, and uh, when we try to interpret something from the neural network, then you know, uh, we only have our hands crossed, our fingers crossed such that, okay, the output of our interpretation algorithm should align well with human knowledge. Otherwise, no one would believe in that, right? So, but mathematically, how do we make sure those interpretations align well with, in, with this knowledge? That is an open problem that has not been solved because, but this has to be solved because if the interpretations does not align well or even you know, contradict with existing human knowledge, then the trustworthiness of the interpretations will be problematic, right? So that is one open problem, how to make this happen. The second one is, okay, so how to train a deep neural network that explicitly leverages this knowledge. So we have a lot of useful knowledge at hand, but you know, nowadays, if you want to go and build a new network, a machine learning scientist will only tell you, okay, give me data. I don't need your knowledge. I just need your data. And you give me the data, I give you the model, and that's done, right? So that is, you know, a total waste of this rich knowledge, right? Because we know those knowledge are true. Those are well demonstrated and well confirmed by, you know, modern medical science. But I mean, for machine learning, machine learning is evil at its first perspective because we don't really use those knowledge fully, right? So how to make good use of this knowledge to do something? We could use, we could possibly use this knowledge to improve the performance of the neural network because those knowledge are valid, right? So if you can embed this knowledge in building the machine learning algorithm, in building your deep learning algorithm, you could possibly improve the performance. And at the same time, since we have this knowledge existing in the neural network, then by identifying which knowledge is used and applied to make the prediction by the neural network, then we could possibly produce very reliable interpretation on the final prediction, right? So that means if we successfully embed this knowledge in developing a neural network, then this will also significantly improve the interpretability of the neural network. And that is something we definitely want, right? So, but these are all open problems. I mean, so far in machine learning area, no one knows how to solve this, you know, uh, very effectively. And another thing that is also very interesting is that, okay, so now we have a neural network and uh, we have a bunch of interpretation methods that could produce interpretations. And then how do we compile these interpretations into new knowledge? That is also a very intriguing open problem to use. Because if we can compile these things into new knowledge, we might be able to generate new clinic ready uh, rules and strategies and principles and policies for, you know, for doctors and clinicians to follow, right? So those are very intriguing applications, uh, I mean, in the cross uh, area of machine learning interpretation and uh, medical health. That is what I think. And uh, okay, so this is just a like summarization of the relationship between these several factors. So we have machine learning models in here, we have interpretation in here, we have human knowledge in here. So, I mean, uh, human knowledge will help to improve the performance of machine learning models. And machine learning models may use a large amount of data to actually come back and discover new knowledge to help complement the human knowledge, right? And the interpretation is actually assisting, uh, acting like an assistant in here. It helps us to discover new knowledge from the machine learning model. And it also helps us to val validate whether those machine learning models are acting correctly that aligns well with human knowledge, right? So that is some you know, very interesting triangle relationship between these three different factors. All right, so here comes to the conclusion of today's talk. Firstly, uh, uh, we have three points of takeaways, right? So the first one is interpretability is one of the most important factor to apply more than, sorry, that's a typo, uh, to apply more than machine learning models in medical health applications. Because in medical health, that is one of those areas that desperately requires interpretations of black box models. And, uh, 
Uh, also, the second one is the necessary properties for reliable interpretation includes exactness, consistency, robustness, and representativeness. If we lack any of these, then the interpretation itself will not be that trustworthy. If the interpretation itself is not that trustworthy, it is meaningless to generate those interpretations. Right? And the last one is uh, open problems to tackle in the future will include two perspectives, I think. It's assisting interpretations by existing knowledge and compound interpretations with new knowledge. So that's the takeaways. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Ling Yang. Um, it, it, certainly for me, it, it always helps when I listen to you because it, I, I get a better understanding of what's going on um, in machine learning. Um, so yeah, I see that uh, Herzl, you've got your hand up. Do you want to go ahead with your question? Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that uh, really interesting presentation. Um, I, there's something that 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 part of the theme of what you're talking about um, was a little bit um, concerning, I guess, and, and maybe maybe it's just that I, I may not have appreciated it. So I don't really understand why we have to um, have insight into how the machine learning algorithm comes up with its conclusion. It's going to come up with. Um, I can think of many examples where we have no idea why something happens. You know, for instance, we use drugs all the time to treat patients. We have no idea how they work. We have stories. We make up stories. The stories are usually wrong. Um, and the drugs still work because we do empirical studies to show that in the end, the drug works. You know, um, you, can, you can train dogs to identify um, people holding guns. And I have no idea. Nobody has any idea what the dog is doing to figure out who's got a gun in their back pocket and who doesn't have a gun. It's a black box, but we have empirical evidence that it works. And so we, we trust it. So why do we have to really understand it? If we do, if we have a machine learning algorithm and then we test it in an empirical way and it causes, and, and it gives us results, which are, it, it makes predictions which come true, then do we really have to understand it? Because I don't you know, um, know that we will ever be able to understand it. We don't know why we look at a dog and recognize it immediately as not being a cat. And why should we think that, a, that, that we'll be able to figure out why a computer does that? So anyways, maybe it's too esoteric, but that, that's, I was just wondering about that. Yeah, so that is actually a typical question to ask. A lot of people ask the similar questions, right? So uh, the answer is like this. So there are some scenarios that you are not going to be able to run repeating experiments. For example, for one single patient, right? So the model predicts that, okay, this patient has some kind of brain cancer. You need to cut that part of brain out in order to cure this person. You're not going to you know, have 1,000 or 1 million copy of the same patient and try to cut different parts of the brain. That's impossible. What you can do is that you got only one chance to decide whether to do the surgery or not. And the patient would you know, only allow you to do the surgery if you could convince him that, okay, so actually I do get the disease. If I don't do the surgery, I may have only like 100 days to live, right? So in this is a very typical scenario where you definitely need an interpretation, even from doctors, not necessarily from a machine learning algorithm. But in, uh, this is the case is that, okay, most of the time machine learning algorithm maybe, you know, it's tiredness, right? So it can, you know, uh, can help doctors to make more precise decisions when, you know, when processing a larger amount of patients. Doctors get tired, but machines don't, right? So they could be a very effective assistant to doctors. So in this way, it is very necessary to interpret the automatic decisions made by machines. To, just to convince your, your patients that, okay, they have to take this medicine, they have to take this surgery, otherwise there will be like serious consequences. That is one uh, case where we need uh, interpretation. And another case related to the drug design. So also with chemical compound synthesis, right? So I'm, I'm not an expert in, uh, in chemical or drug design. I'm not an expert in that, but as, as far as I know, as what I've heard from my friends and collaborators, 
uh, especially for chemical compounds. What they are doing now is, okay, so they're running computer simulations to try to use a computer algorithm to, uh, to test and to predict what the possible structures of a compound could have some kind of possible, um, uh, possible properties. Say if you want to synthesize a new material, new compound, and you expect to have some properties, then the computer will have to, you know, to generate one million tests on different structures of the compound and also tell you, okay, uh, according to our deep learning algorithm, which compound have a higher probability to achieve your desired uh, uh, property, target property, right? So in this way, if there's no interpretation, say if the computer comes up with 1,000 candidates, all very promising, you will cost a lot of money to test each of them, to try those out, right? But if this algorithm can interpret, okay, so for this compound, the algorithm tells that, okay, it has a 99% to achieve your desired property because of this certain structure that exists in that compound. Then you could easily verify whether this is true or not using you know, existing human knowledge. We know that some, I mean, so for some compounds, they are easy to cause cancer because they have some kind of special, you know, uh, structure in the compound. And even for COVID-19, we know that it is very infectious because there are some kind of, you know, protein structure on the outside of the virus, right? So if we have such an interpretation, this will not only save money, but also speed up the entire process of designing new compounds. I mean, I believe that drugs are compounds as well, right? So that could be helpful in that way. Okay, thank you. See that we've got a question in the chat from Weil and it's, um, if we know models function formula, the features used and the weights applied by the model, why is it so in challenging to interpret a model's decision? Well, so uh, <clears throat> the thing is that for deep learning algorithms, we do not know the function formula, right? So uh, that is actually the evil part of deep mm -hmm. learning. <laughs> yeah, deep learning models don't have an explicitly written function formula. Classical machine learning algorithms have a function formula, but deep learning, the formula is deeply embedded in this complicated structure but the structure does not have an analytical form. I mean, it has an analytical form, but it's, you know, it's many functions wrapped up together. So composition, uh, many layers of compositions of functions, you know, mathematicians, uh, people who are experts in mathematics, they are you know, trying, they are struggling to analyze that, but you know, so far, no progress. So that's the, that's the problem. <laughs> that, that is indeed the reason why. <laughs> um, does anybody else have any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Linge. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, in the absence of seeing any hands or hearing anybody speak up. Um, I guess, oh, no. Okay, thanks, Alfonso, for your comment. I guess one challenge, the question that I have is, because to me, these open questions that you proposed are quite interesting. Um, it, it sort of what, what would be the duration that you would need to to spend say if you were trying to apply our knowledge into developing a model uh, like, like how much work is that like like do you think these these open problems are going to take years or or are we on a more expedited path yeah so uh that question is actually very difficult to answer because it is not well defined. So it depends on what you want to achieve, right? So if you just want to, you know, to achieve some, you know, publication of papers in some top venues, that's easy, a year would be enough. Yeah, but if you want to build up a system that is, you know, clinical ready or hospital ready, uh, hospital ready, that actually could be, you know, to, to be applied to in real use and make money, then that could take years. So some of the complexity, I guess, is, is yes. part of the challenge. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm cognizant of time and I know that you have a hard stop at 5 p.m. Um, yes. So 
So I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation and, and thank everybody for attending. Uh, we are planning a few more um, speakers in this series around AI machine learning applied to, to healthcare. If there are any particular topics that you would like covered, please let me know. Um, you can send me an email. Um, I'm lockerc at mcmaster.ca. Um, but uh, I would like to, again, thank um, Dr. Chu very much for, for explaining um, how <laughs> sort of some of the approaches that we could take to learning about interpreting our, our neural networks. Thanks so much. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, Bye -bye. thanks. Thank Take you. care.